Great. Okay. <laughs> For, for the two most widespread species in Switzerland, beech and Norway spruce, uh, there will be a shift during the next decades to its uh, lower area, a smaller area uh, along the whole landscape in Switzerland. They will move to its uh, suitability, will only be valid in higher elevations, and the new niches will be occupied by other species like oak and the common hornbeam. This not only holds the suitability for the adult trees, but also for regeneration. There are some models I haven't shown up to now uh, on beech and Norway spruce, how it looks like in, uh, in the next 50 years. Um, the niche for regeneration is gone in the lowlands, in the whole central plateau. All that you can see in uh, yellow, these are the areas where regeneration won't, fu uh, won't function any longer. Uh, in 2080. This holds for Novi spruce for both small seedlings and the taller uh, seedlings. And for beech, this will be for the small ones and uh, to a lesser degree for the taller ones. So we also have a regeneration problem. And um, translated also to communities, there will be a shift of the uh, broadleaf. Uh, com communities, beach communities, sycamore communities to higher altitudes. So uh, the coniferous uh, communities will shrink in their area. And in addition, we also will have some places where there is no, no climate uh, in the next 60 years that is suitable for a combination of species that are present now in Switzerland. And these are the black areas. Everywhere where it is pointed in black, we have a problem with forest in general because we don't know what is, um, uh, we, we, we don't have this community at the moment in Switzerland. So this is the potential area where we need new species or even non-native tree species. What is the situation in Switzerland for the non-native tree species? Um, the share on the whole forest is less than 1%. Um, 0.25% is covered by Robinia, black locust, and, the, and about 0.2% uh, is Douglas fir. For the black locust, this is the area uh, occupied by black locust. It's more or less uh, contiguously spread all over the lower areas in Switzerland. And this also is the same picture that also Bart has already mentioned for whole Europe. Uh, it's really widespread, but the reason for this widespread is also because it's heavily invasive in, in, the, in the traits that is, it has this species. In contrast, for the Douglas fir species, it's not so contiguous uh, spread all over the low lower areas in Switzerland. However, many of these reportings of the species in the landscape are not um, consistent because many people do not know exactly the difference to the Norway spruce. So actually this is also continuously spread in the lowlands and we do not have this uh, proper data on. But it is already spread up to 1600 meters above sea level. This means uh, it can grow really at higher altitudes and it's in any way always planted. So there is no spread of this air, of this species. There is of course natural regeneration, but there is no spread because I mean, it's a coniferous tree and the limitation is clearly given by the seed weight and the seed distribution that is uh, on wind distribution, not on bird distribution. What was the motivation in earlier times for Douglas fir? I mean, it's quite clear. Uh, it came from the United States and this I only show because this, I found this picture and it's really nice. Probably one of the tallest trees they have found in the natural forests, cut it into pieces and transported it. And they were also planted in the first wave, I would call this, in the, from the 19, uh, 1880s uh, about. 
these are the first plantations in Switzerland and the pictures are already 100 years old. And as you can see also, if Douglas fir is planted densely, there is almost no vegetation under, underneath. So this, is, this means also this like exclusion of other vegetation was already a subject 100 years ago. So I read some, um, some information on that time, already 1900, where people really opposed to non-native non tree species, exactly out of the same reason as we do now today. Um, today, the tallest trees in Germany and in Switzerland are both Douglas fir, over 16 meters tall, and the tallest ever measured uh, tree found globally was also Douglas fir, 133 meters. Um, today, I will say this is the second wave in Switzerland, as Douglas fir is now planted as a future tree in many openings in the lowland forests. Um, and this is really in high numbers that it is planted now. And as I already said, it also can regenerate naturally uh, underneath of the model trees that uh, stand in, in proximity. And then there is like an incentive, uh, not so, so it's different now. Um, the production is not the first aim now when planting Douglas fir, it's of course a big aim, but of course it's also the resistance. And it was like um, amplified by the effect, effects of summer drought in 2018 and 2019, where um, beach forests were affected heavily. And this is a picture of 2020 of a beach forest. You, you can see maybe uh, there's only 25% of the beech trees left in this forest. And also we have this problem in the Norway spruce mortality because the relation, the, the interaction of drought and bark beetles. We also have problems of Scotspine mortality, and this is more towards the, the central parts of the Alps, and it goes up to 1500 meters above sea level, uh, where we have a strong mortality of these tree species, first affected by drought effects and continuous drought effects uh, during several years, and then the bark beetle outbreak. Um, bark beetles, this is a nice series of uh, number of damaged timber, uh, so the area of cubic meters of damaged timber during the last 33 years. And as it can be seen, after the storms, Vivian, Lothar, and Brooklyn, and Baia, uh, there was always an uh, overpopulation or the aggradation of these bark beetles, and this was of course, amplified by the drought effects, uh, the summer drought, summer heat of 2003 and summer heat of 2018 amplified <laughs> this gradation quite heavily. And this holds mostly for Douglas fir. It is funny, I, I did a um, study recently on the drought, effect, drought event in 1947 at that time not Norway spruce was the, uh, the big problem, but it was uh, silver fir. At that time, more silver fir were planted in, in the landscape of Switzerland and drought affected them, bark beetle outbreak on these species. Now it's Norway spruce. It's really a matter of which species is uh, dominant in the landscape and how it will be affected by these bark beetles. And this is uh, a recent picture showing on the one hand, uh, left side slide, uh, the Norway spruce that is affected by these bark beetles. And next, to, next to it, uh, there is a Douglas fir that is not affected. This is on 1500 meters above sea level and in the valley of Valais, so in the central part of the Alps. And on the right hand, close by a uh, test plantation of 10 years old saplings. Uh, Douglas fir was planted and also uh, Scots pine. And I mean, the one drought resistant species at that until this time was, Douglas, was Scots pine in this area. And the Douglas fir does a much better job. So also for the regeneration, if it is planted, then we have like advantages. I would not say that uh, natural regeneration always uh, can take place 
um, because I mean there is a lot of competition at, but at some places where the um, ground vegetation is lacking out of different reasons, then um, um, Douglas fir can really uh, start over. So in summary, we have problems in three, in three widespread species, in the Scots pine, in the Norway spruce, and in the beech, up to elevations of 600 meters right now. Uh, above, um, beech does not pose too big problem at the moment, but this can change by increasing temperatures. And the situation um, <coughs> for the portfolio in the future uh, is as follows. So many of these future tree species are currently tested by the local foresters at different places, like spontaneously, it's not organized, but every forester can do what he likes in his, in his forests. So tested are oak species, chestnut, Douglas fir. There is no official advice of the cantonal or federal offices. Um, there's, I would call this an official hesitation uh, but there are this test plantation project I already uh, reported from Peter Baum and Katrin Steit, and this is supported by the Swiss Federal Office of the Environment. There is also uh, a lot of communication on the non-native tree species, for instance, a special issue in the Swiss Forestry Journal on Douglas fir. And there is now, uh, quite recently, the Swiss Forest Owner Association in uh, collaboration with the School of Agricultural, Forest and Food Science, Havel, uh, close to Bern. They started an information campaign uh, on the subject Douglas fir, a future tree. And I want to promote this. Uh, during the last week, these three, um, three videos have been uploaded to the <coughs> web and they can be watched. And one is on the Douglas fir, like the origin and the suitability as a future tree. Then um, some aspects on the forest protection on these three species. And then we have two experts. They look quite serious on the Douglas fir and the ecological processes on, uh, and biodiversity. This is uh, by Thibault Lascha and Martin Gossner. I did the first part and Valentin Gillo the second part. So there are three videos. Please visit this site and it's in German and in French. So it's uh, so these are three different qualities of the of the videos. My my quality feel is, is a bit basic. I would say it's not comparable to TV. And the last one on the Douglas fir uh, and the biodiversity is quite professionally made. So. Um, these are three tries to somehow open the field and and give to the forest owners. And these are at least, I, I think, 60,000 forest owners in Switzerland to present them a future tree species. And uh, some words on these test plantations, uh, the project of, of Peter Braun and Katrin Streit. Uh, as already reported earlier, these are 60 sites all over Switzerland. And on these sites, um, there are some fenced areas uh, in which uh, nine to 18 species are planted in combination. Uh, the core species are beech, Douglas fir, Novice spruce, large Scots pine, Cecil pine, uh, oak, silver fir, sycamore, and small leafed lime. And there are some additional species. And here we have more non-native tree species like Italian, Italian maple, Atlas cedar, Turkish hazel, turkey oak, and wild service tree. So um, as I only realized this year and the last year, Atlas cedar is a species that is widespread in the south of the Alps. And it's almost not spread in the north of the Alps. So this means this would be for the north of the Alps like a real new species to test first. And this is also why we test this um, in a polytunnel project. First, uh, on these places, uh, on the 60 places, we do not only check these tree species, but also provenances of the tree species. For each of these tree species, we have four to eight different provenances. So this means we have like a, a high variety of different um, um, ecological information on these three species. In this polytunnel project, 
that are located at three of these 60 places. We test beech, sessile oak, silver fir, Douglas fir, Atlas cedar, and Turkey, uh, Turkish oak. Um, these polytunnels have the size of uh, are about five meters tall, four by six meters in area. And we try to produce at these places like a climate that is two to four degrees in average higher than ambient. In these polytunnels, we plant these six different species and we use for each of these species four provenances. And so uh, the, these trees have been planted in the last fall and is, um, is outside the ambient area and inside in the polytunnels. And in the first year, we need to rise up these seedlings. We have to be sure that most of them will survive the first year. And afterwards, there will be an automatic irrigation system um, that will somehow exactly measure uh, the ambient water table or uh, water addition that is only 50% of the ambient precipitation. And so we can check different future climates. And up to now, in this first year after plantation or in the first spring after plantation, we, all have it, uh, we already have measured phenological aspects. And we see that in the polytools, it's not a surprise that some of the species are really like two to three weeks in advance of of uh, bud breaking and uh, leaf unfolding. So this is an important aspect that like the vegetation period will be longer for these trees. Um, the first experiences after six months are that, that the practitioners in the field are quite interested in the results. They are highly curious, curious about the new species. They are less curious about the differences between the provenances. But in general, they are uh, open-minded and not only, only the foresters, but also the, the forest visitors. This polytunnel, uh, they are standing in, in public forests and people visiting people or school classes wandering around. They are all quite interested in seeing what, what is going on here. And, to, and in future, it will be even more interesting to compare the different species, how they grow, uh, in combination for competition and so, so this will be quite interesting. And in addition to these uh, more practical aspects of the running research, we have uh, produced a special issue in Douglas Fir uh, in the last year, where we summarize our results in some um, um, advices how to plant uh, Douglas Fir. Uh, not to plant it in pure stands, but to plant it or to admix it to, to stands to increase the biodiversity of the tree species and how this affects the birds and the insects and, or the fungi um, in this environment. And there is a, a review on this Douglas fir um, where um, all possible papers have been uh, screamed as uh, skimmed for for um, effects impacts of Douglas fir on the soil and on the biodiversity and this is the result can be read it's in German and we also did some um, checks on the invisibility or I mean it's not invisible but on the regeneration potential of the Douglas fir in different places in Switzerland and the result is quite clear it only can um, compete if there is no ground vegetation in the, and if there is enough light on the ground. And so with this, um, I come already to the conclusion, the use of non-native tree species in Switzerland um, in Swiss forest is an option for the future, it's quite clear. To plant non-natives means also, however, to monitor their potential impacts on the native biodiversity. And we try to do all this by research and by adequate uh, communication.